Our scene opens today in an emergency session of the World Economic Council, attended by the greatest financial wizards of our time, including their chairman, fiduciary Jay Blurt. Gentlemen, we're face to face with disaster. Say on, fiduciary. Well, as we all know, the real basis for our world economy is not gold. No. Not, not silver. Not gold. No, no. Not even uranium. No, no, no. But that solid, everlasting, rock rib security, the box top. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even a box top. It therefore pains me to tell you, gentlemen, that someone, somewhere, somehow, is counterfeiting box tops. Counterfeiting box tops? Can't a man have faith in anything? And unless we catch the culprit soon, the economy of the whole world as we know it is doomed. It will demolish the dollar. Ruin the robo. The franc will fall. Even the drachma will drip. Drop a droop. This fiend in human form must be found. But how? We must be on the lookout for anyone who has an unusually large number of box tops. And when we spot him... Liquidate him immediately. At this moment, our agents are everywhere. Suppose it's just somebody who likes to hoard box tops. Nonsense, old boy. Who'd be stupid enough to hoard box tops? A good question, that, but the answer was ridiculously simple. For at that moment, in the little town of Frostbite Falls, Minnesota... 63,821, 63,822... How you doing, Bullwinkle? Oh, hi, Rocky. Just caught my box tops before I take them to the bank. Boy, you sure have saved a mess of them. Oh, I didn't save them all. I inherited some from my Uncle Dulap. He left you box tops? Yeah, and 14 miles of string, too. Oh, he was a saving fool. How many are there, Bullwinkle? Well, I just got up to, uh, uh, oh, buttermilk. I lost count. Why don't you let the bank count it for you? Hey, that's a good idea. And a little while later, the boys were trundling a wheelbarrow full of box tops into the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank. The clerk took one look at them and ran to the president's office. Mr. Fremley, Mr. Fremley, can I see you a minute? Tabagas, please. Can't you see I'm foreclosing a mortgage? But it's an emergency, sir. Box tops? A barrow full. Come on, come on. Oop. Please, madam, you're getting my spat soggy. Could we have a little service, please? <laughs> Why, yes, sir, sir, certainly, sir. Arbogast, call the police. The FBI, my wife. I'd like to start a box top account with your bank. But, but, yeah, 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 sir. What kind? Uh, just checking? No, I really mean it. Meanwhile, a bevy of law enforcement officers were converging on the bank. Okay, when I give the word, we grab him. Is he really dangerous, Chief? Anybody who would counterfeit box tops would do anything. Gee. So if he makes one funny move, let him have it. There you are, my life savings. Uh, how, how much is there? Looks like millions. Yeah, or even thousands. Hear that? That's our man, all right. You mean Moose? Yeah. Careful now. What are you doing with that empty bag, Bowen? Oh, I just can't resist popping them, Rock. That sure gonna disturb the other people in the bag. Oh, they won't care. Here goes. That Bullwinkle! Boy, they're sure touchy. Well, it certainly looks bad for our boys. Will our story end right here before we find out who is really behind the sinister box top racket? Don't fail to see our next episode of Fault in the Vault or Banks a Million. Last time you recall, the members of the World Economic Council were horrified to discover that somebody was counterfeiting box tops, the real basis of the world's monetary system. Suspicion immediately fell on Bullwinkle Moose, owner of the world's largest collection of genuine box tops. So when he and Rocky tried to open a box top account at the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank... Get down, Bullwinkle! It's okay, Rocky. I'm a depositor. Boy, my credit rate must have gone down. This is the police. We know you're in there. You can't fool them, fellas, can you? Come out with your hands up. Okay. And when Bullwinkle emerged, he was quickly shoved into a patrol wagon and whisked away. I'll send you my address as soon as I get settled, Rock. Meanwhile, in an old brownstone house in the middle of a large city, a mysterious figure worked over a printing press. One, two, three, a liri, four, five, six, a liri, seven, eight, nine, a liri, ten, a liri, box top. Yes, unbelievable though it may seem, the box top counterfeiter was really Boris Badenov, that notorious no good nick, that venal villain, that delinquent demon, that... He's no use. Flattery will get you nowhere. Boris, darling, next load of box tops is ready to roll. Very well, Natasha, let's go. And Boris and Natasha dashed to their friendly neighborhood grocer to carry out their fiendish plan. 
Hello. You are my friendly neighborhood grocer. That's me, little fellow. You are giving away atomic-powered roller skates? Yep, with 16 box tops. You got 16 box tops? <laughs> I got 16 million box tops. And a short while later, Boris left with the store's entire supply of atomic-powered roller skates. Of course, that meant that there were none to give to the children who came for them later. Come on. You a friendly neighborhood grocer, aren't you? Uh, yes, but I... It's I... a jip, that's what. Let's go to our friendly neighborhood druggist instead. Too late. Boris had already gone to his friendly neighborhood druggist, his friendly neighborhood hardware dealer, and even his friendly neighborhood lumber and feed store. In one day, there wasn't a store in town that could redeem box tops. Of course, the kids got hopping mad. Juvenile protest meetings were organized. Pint-sized pickets paraded in front of every store. As a result, business plummeted. And at the World Economic Council, panic reigned. Look at that stock report. Friendly Neighborhood Grocer, Inc., down 15 points. Friendly Neighborhood Druggist Preferred, down 22. It's the beginning of the end, gentlemen. Hold on. Here's a report from one of our agents. Hello? What does he say? Yes, yes, good. They've got the counterfeiter. Yay! Yay! Who is it, fiduciary? Some person named Ballwinky, I think. Man or a woman? He claims to be a moose. Sure enough, at that moment, Bullwinkie, uh, uh, Bullwinkle was at police headquarters undergoing some very tough questioning. Okay, where'd you get all those box tops? Well, I eat a lot of cereal at breakfast. 85,000 boxes full. Well, I like a snack before going to bed, too. How come you never turned them in? Couldn't make up my mind what I wanted. What do you think, Chief? He's either a criminal mastermind or a stupid bird brain. Do I get a choice? The only choice you'll get, Moose, is between 10 and 20 years. You can't do that to my pal. Watch carefully. Gee, Bullwinkle, maybe they can. Can they? Don't miss our next episode, Calaboose Moose, or The Crime of Your Life. Well, in the Battle of the Box Tops, it looks as if the first round goes to Boris Badenov, for he has succeeded in dumping thousands of counterfeit box tops on the market, cleaning the premiums out of store after store. As a result, box top savers all over the country are seeing their life savings wiped out as their box tops become worthless. You mean I can't trade these in 25 words or less for an English yo-yo that whistles on the road to Mandalay? Not even with 50 words or less, Grandad. You mean my box tops aren't worth anything? Not a bean, son. There's nothing to trade them for. Gee, eight years old and I'm a ruined man. Yes, things were tough all over, especially in the back room of police headquarters, where Bullwinkle was still being questioned. All right, Moose, are you going to confess or not? Well, I'd like to, fellas, but I promised my dear old mother. Promised her what? That I'd never tell a fib. Okay, Muldoon, put him back in the pokey. But as Bullwinkle headed for a cell, a voice was heard from outside. X3, box top bad man strikes again. Stores close and Wichita falls. Now see what you've done, you monster. But, Chief, Bullwinkle's been in here all the time. So? So how could he be here and in Wichita Falls at the same time? Hmm. You aren't twins, are you? Certainly not. I got enough trouble just being one of me. Now can we go, Chief? Nope. This telegram says I'm supposed to turn you over to the World Economic Council. Economic eggheads, huh? Some of the biggest brains in the world. And they want to see fluff-headed little me? You and your buddy. Come on, Bullwinkle. And while our friends headed for the airport, those foxy four-flushers, Boris Badenoff and Natasha Fatal, were busy counting their ill-gotten gains. Let's see. Two warehouses full cowboy hats with real bullet holes. Check, darling. 3,000 sacks of crocheted hubcaps. Check, darling. 197 years supply of dental floss. Check, darling. Oh, boy, Natasha. We're rolling in vital consumer goods. Just wait till I call central control. But as the gleeful Boris was trying to contact his superior, a fast jet was landing at Washington, and Rocky and Bullwinkle were met by a host of reporters and photographers. What are you in town for, sir? I can't see. Why did the World Economic Council call you? I can't see. How long will you be here? I can't see. Why can't you say? Because I don't know. But a short while later in the office of the World Economic Council, Bullwinkle found out. Mr. Moose, I understand you are the world's largest collector of box tops. Well, yes. Of course, I have quite a few cigar bands, too. Now, with your great knowledge of real box tops, perhaps you can find out just who is making counterfeit box tops and thus ruining world economy. You want me to? You and your friend, Rocky J. Squirrel. But why me, Mr. Blurt? Well, this is the Rocky Show, isn't it? Of course. 
I keep forgetting. But just then, the door burst open. Mr. Blurt, look here. More bad news? Yeah. Bogus box tops are flooding into Upper What You Call a Stand. Upper, Upper What, what You Call a Stand? stand. Where in the world is that? That's just it. It's a tiny little country that nobody knows about. Nobody? Nobody, except the men in this room. Uh-oh. Gentlemen, one of you is in cahoots with a box top bad man. Well, there's a plot development for you. Which of these men is working hand in glove with Boris Badenov? Don't miss our next exciting episode when a felon needs a friend or pantomime quizzling. Last time you remember, Rocky dropped a bombshell under the meeting of the World Economic Council when he told its members... Gentlemen, one of you is in cahoots with a box-top bad man. Impossible. I think he's right. Was his cahoots? Look, if phony box-tops are showing up in what you call us, Dan... And they are. And if nobody even knows where it is except you people... And they don't. Then, ergo, one of you must be sending the counterfeit box-tops there. Brilliant deduction. Magnifique. What a brain. And he's my buddy. We must find out which one of us it is. And I know just the man to do the job. Who's that? Our chief security officer. Call him quickly. Calling Inspector Soames. Inspector Hemlock Soames. Come in, please. Come in. I am in. You're the chief security officer? Hemlock Soames at your service. Your crime is my crime. Allow me to introduce my English assistant, Dr. Watkins. Cheerio, y'all. She's English? From the south of England. You know, way down yonder in Newton Abbott. Oh, of course. Now, what's up, gentlemen? Mr. Squirrel thinks that someone in our group is in league with the box top Batman. <laughs> easy, easy there. Oh, thanks, old chappy, darling. Elementary, my dear Watkins. And I'll bet whoever it is has his counterfeit box tops hidden right in this building, too. In this building? <laughs> Impossible. But, darling... Cheer up, Dr. Watkins. I think we ought to search the whole building. Well, if you insist... I do insist. Okay, let's go. Do you think you can find the culprit, Inspector Soames? Buddy, if I can't find him, who can? Well, the squirrel has done it again, Boris. Duh. How could such a little nebbish have such a big mouth? The search party looked high and low through the building without finding a thing. For an hour, they searched and finally found themselves on the top floor of the building. Okay, last floor. You chap search in there, we search in here. Right. Boris, what are you doing? Look. Boris, you send him into the clock tower. Sure enough, our friends found themselves in a musty room full of huge clockwork wheels and gears. Ouch! I feel like an ant in a wristwatch. Yeah, we're lucky these gears are moving so slow. They'd be pretty dangerous. But Rocky had reckoned without the fiendish mind of Hemlock Soames, alias Boris Badenov. For at that moment, the villain was smashing the mechanism that controlled the speed of the huge clock. Listen, Natasha, the clock is gaining. It was true. Without their controlling mechanism, the huge gears turned faster and faster. Look at these gears go, Bullwinkle. Yeah, how time flies when you're having fun. Something's gone wrong, Bullwinkle. The controls must have broken. Yeah, I figure we gained about a week and a half already. We better get out of here. I'm with you, Rock. Hey, the door! It's... Let me at it, Rock. I'll bust it open. Bullwinkle threw himself at the door, but it held fast, and the mighty moose tottered backward. Look out, Bullwinkle! Too late, for Bullwinkle had disappeared into a whirling mass of machinery. Don't miss our next exciting episode. Give them the works, or rock around the clock. Well, since Boris Badenov pushed them into a clock tower and wrecked the controls, time is really flying for Rocky and Bullwinkle. And when Bullwinkle tried to break through the door, he bounced right into the whirling machinery. Bullwinkle, where are you? I'm right down here at about half past two. I want to fly down and get to the milk. And the plucky squirrel eased himself out through a small window in the face of the clock and leaped into space. And just in time, too. Down and down he streaked, then shot right through the window of the conference room of the World Economic Council. The clock! The clock is out of control. The members ran to the window and looked out. Sure enough, the enormous clock was acting in a most peculiar way. Oh, this is terrible. You said it.
that, Mr. Blurt. Bullwinkle's inside that thing. No, you don't understand. That's the biggest clock in the city. The whole town regulates its time by our clock. Things must be awful down there. Fiduciary Blurt was quite right, for even though the huge clock hand swung wildly, people still tried to regulate their lives by its time. Good morning, dear. Leaving for work? You out of your mind, Mabel. I just got home. Hurry, Walter. You'll be late for school. But it's the middle of the night, Mom. The law needs mowing, Woodrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Don't be silly, Woodrow. Tomorrow was over yesterday. Meanwhile, Rocky and Fiduciary Blurt had rushed to the clock tower. We gotta break down the door. Here, let's use this fire axe. Allow me, young man. It's Hemlock Soames, the chief security officer. Stand back, please. You shouldn't get hit by splinters. Da, da, de, da, da. Hurry! My pal is in danger! Of course, little fellow. But as Burroughs swung the axe back, he let go of it and it flew out the window. Oh, I'm such a bother, fingers. Now we'll never get into the clock tower. Meanwhile, Bullwinkle had succeeded in climbing to a small platform just above the whirling machinery. Boy, safe at last. Little did Bullwinkle know that he was standing right next to the clock's chimes, and as the hand moved to 15 after, a huge hammer drew back, ready to strike the quarter hour with Bullwinkle's head as its target. Meanwhile, Rocky was searching for something with which to smash the tower door open. Hey, there. What you doing in my broom closet? I'm looking for something to open the tower door with. By yeemini, you're in luck, little feller. I got a special thing yours for that. An axe? No. A battering ram? No. A sledgehammer? No. What is it? Well, I call it a key. A key? Well, let me have it. And Rocky dashed off with the key to the tower. Unfortunately for the janitor, the keychain was still fastened to his belt. Oh, he's a cute little squirrel. <laughs> this must be the wrong key. It's open. Thanks a lot, mister. That's okay. Just get his license number. Bullwinkle? Yeah, Rock. Ooh. The huge hammer missed Bullwinkle's head by a whisker. But the vibration that followed knocked him off his platform and out of the window in the clock face. He's gone. Let me look. Oh, poor fellow. Gee, Mr. Soames, is he... Don't look. You wouldn't like it. Boris, he's really gone? I hate to say this, Natasha, but no. Sure enough, Bullwinkle was at that moment hanging by his fingertips from the hand of the clock, which showed 20 minutes after four. So what we do now? <laughs> we just wait till half past. Don't miss our next episode, Crime on My Hands, or Hickory Dickory Drop. Well, last time, you remember, we were, uh, uh, where were we last time? Oh, come on now. This is Fiduciary Blurt, chairman of the World Economic Council. Yes, and we are horrified because somebody is counterfeiting box tops, the basis of the world's economy. And Bullwinkle and I have been hired to find the counterfeiters. We're being helped by Mr. Blurt's chief security officer. Allow me to introduce myself. Hemlock Soames. And this is my assistant, Dr. Watkins. Pee -pee -pee -pee. But you two are really... Ta -ta, don't be blabbermouth, you blabbermouth. And meanwhile, I, Bullwinkle Moose, am dangling by my pinky tips from this here clock hand. Got the picture now? I've got it. Okay, let's go. Has Moose dropped off yet, darling? No, he's only 26 after. But at half past... True enough, as the clock hand approached the half hour, Bullwinkle slipped nearer and nearer the end of it. Nearer and nearer the end of me, too. And unfortunately for Bullwinkle, Rocky thought he had already fallen. Poor Bullwinkle. How can I carry on? Oh, don't feel bad, Rock. I can't help it. You were my best friend. Yeah, I was, wasn't I? Bullwinkle, is it really you? You got any other buddies with antlers? What are you doing out there? Just hanging around. What time you got, Rock? About 4.29 and a half. Why? Because at 4.30, I got an appointment to fall off this here clock. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle. We gotta get you in here. I sort of hoped you'd think of that. Here, let me grab your feet. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> I got ticklish hooks. But at that moment, the huge clock hand moved another minute. Oh, 4.30. Well, I must be going. And Bullwinkle's hands lost their grip. Fortunately, our boy Rocky was able to pull his feet under the window so that he wound up hanging by his knees hundreds of feet above the ground. Give me your hand, Bullwinkle. I'll, I'll try to pull you in. Hurry, 
Mira, the blood is rushing through my antlers. It's no use, Bullwinkle. You weigh too much. Yeah, I shouldn't have eaten such a heavy lunch. Well, hang on, Bullwinkle. Somebody's bound to notice you sooner or later. Sure enough, at that moment, Bullwinkle was being observed from the park across the street. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Edward. What's that, Chauncey? A moose hanging out of the casement window. Oh, I don't know, Chauncey. Casement windows are getting pretty popular. Fortunately, at that moment, the chairman of the World Economic Council, Fiduciary Blurt, happened to glance out of his window. Oh, goodness, goodness. Please, there is a lady present. That moose fella is still hanging out there. Hmm. He's past 430. He's late. Mr. Soames, you must save him. Who, me? What can you do? Easy. I get rope like this, make noose like this, and bless you moose with noose like that. Thanks a thousand, Mr. Soames. Gee, I guess I was wrong, Bullwinkle, not trusting him. Well done, Soames. Elementary, my dear Watkins. And I only forgot one thing. What was that? I didn't face another end of lesu. And sure enough, when Bullwinkle reached the end of his rope, he kept right on going. Don't miss our next exciting episode, Down to Earth or the Bullwinkle Bounce. While in the search for the box top Batman, our friend Bullwinkle is pavement bound in a hurry, for Boris Badenov, disguised as a detective, has thrown him a rope and failed to fasten the other end of it. I knew I forgot something. <laughs> Hokey smoke, I gotta save him. And Rocky the plucky flying squirrel plunged downward after his friend. He seized the end of the rope, shot past Bullwinkle, and fastened it to a projecting flagpole. When Bullwinkle reached the end of his rope, the flagpole bent like a fishing rod, then straightened out and snapped him up again right into the window of the World Economic Council, where a meeting was in progress. What do you see next item on the agenda? I'm not sure, but I think it's me. On the floor above, Boris was still congratulating himself on the end of Bullwinkle. <laughs> oh, Boris, you are a sly rogue. If you do say so yourself, <laughs> you were born to be kissed. <laughs> But just then, Fiduciary Blurt poked his head into the room. Oh, Mr. Soames, he's safe. The moose is safe. Of course he's safe. When I do job, I do the safe. Well, Natasha, look what you've done now. Not me, darling. Look there. Wait for me, Bullwinkle. I'll be right up. Raskolnikov is that idiot squirrel again. Once more he is hero. Well, if he is hero, we should give him flowers, right? Right. Well, let's do it. Congratulations, little fellow. Thanks, Mr. Soames. And to show my appreciation, here is high-class potted palm. But... No, don't thank me. It's the least I can do. And the heavy pot whistled down through the air. Things looked black for our hero. And this might have been the last episode, except that Bullwinkle chose that moment to stick his head out of the window. See, Rock, we're... A... Oh, oh, oh. Bullwinkle, are you all right? Oh, this is terrible. Yeah, a palm tree just fell on your head. Oh, is that all? <laughs> I thought I had a bad case of the green leafy antlers. In just a moment, Rocky and Bullwinkle were in the corridors of the council building speaking with fiduciary Blurt. Well, gentlemen, you'll never find the box top counterfeiters at this rate. But I'm sure they're storing their box tops right in this building. Why? Because it's the last place anybody with brains would look for them. That's why we're looking here first. You hear that, Boris? I'm not deaf, Natasha. Dumb, maybe, but not deaf. Come on. Oh, it's our chief security officer, Hemlock Soames. And his assistant, Dr. Watkins. What have you deduced about this case, Mr. Soames? Simple old chippy. He's obviously Vorik of criminal mastermind. Is that criminal J mastermind? No, he means it's some mysterious big shop, Bullwinkle. Oh. Then we must be on the lookout for an arch fiend. Is that... A... No, it's not arch J fiend. Just ask him. I still think he has his phony box top somewhere in this building. <laughs> Such imagination, eh, Dr. Watkins? But Hemlock, old bean, that's where... Shut your English dialect mouth, Dr. Watkins. But we've already searched this building from top to bottom. Then for a change, let's search it from bottom to top. We'll go clear down to the basement and start all over again. Right, Rock. Come on! And Bullwinkle stalked off toward the elevators. No, Archie, what's his name is gonna get the betterment of Bullwinkle Moose? Oh, I do hope he doesn't try to use the elevator. That's out of order. What? If I know Bullwinkle, he will. Wait! If you didn't done it yet, done did it! Too late, for Bullwinkle at that moment opened the door of the elevator and stepped right into an empty shaft. Whoa! Don't miss our next episode, Fall Story, or Adrift in the Lift. 
Bullwinkle. Last time you remember, the intrepid Bullwinkle started off to find the box top bad man, and as his first step, walked right into an abandoned elevator shaft. Ooh, there he goes again. Again? Does this happen often? Yeah, but not twice in one day. Courage, Bullwinkle, I'll save you. That's mighty thoughty of you, Rock. Bullwinkle, you didn't fall down the elevator shaft. Was I supposed to? Isn't the shaft empty? No, but watch out for that first step. They ought to put up a sign. But what are you standing on? Oh, nothing much. Just a mess of box tops. Box tops? Bullwinkle, you've discovered the hiding place. Where, where? Right there. Sure enough, that abandoned elevator shaft was the hiding place for millions of counterfeit box tops. They were stacked from the basement almost to the top floor. Marvelous. A remarkable job of detection, Mr. Squirrel. Thanks, Mr. Blurt. We... Hey, what's happening to Bullwinkle? Sure enough, as they watched, Bullwinkle seemed to drop lower and lower in the shaft. Good heavens, he's shrinking. Nonsense, who ever heard of a midget move? It is kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Sure. But how come my head is bending low? Somebody must be pulling box tops off the bottom of the pile. Indeed, somebody was. For down in the basement, Boris and Natasha were shoveling counterfeit box tops into a huge truck as fast as they could. Boris, darling, I thought this hiding place was foolproof. Foolproof, yes. Idiot proof, no. You got plan, darling? I always got plan. They don't ever work, but I always got one. What is this one? Wait till Squirrel shows up and I tell you. How you know he'll show up? You offer you lovely chump, Natasha? I bet right now he's saying, Hokey smog, Bullwinkle. I, I better, better go, go down, down and, and see who's at the bottom of all this. Wait up, Rock. I'll come with you. And entering the next elevator, Rocky and Bullwinkle started down to the basement. See, Natasha, here they come now. All right, darling. Now what's the plan? You're taking notes? Of course, darling. Very well. Write these down. Into elevator chef day, I place can of TNTB. When elevator hits plunger C, it blows up like D. And where are we when it happens? <laughs> where else? O-U-T. Come on. And the two villains leaped into their truck and sped off into the night. You think this plan will work, Boris? Well, there's a first time for everything, Natasha. And it looked as if this were Boris's lucky day, for at that moment the elevator came down the shaft A toward the explosive B, it struck the plunger C, and the TNT went off like D. But the result was a little different than Boris expected, for the explosion drove the elevator car up the shaft like a rocket. That's funny. I thought I pushed the down button. With a crash, the car burst through the roof and zoomed into the air. Look! Up there, in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's an elevator! And as the horrified populace watched, the elevator with our two friends aboard disappeared into the clouds. Boy, they sure got a lot of floors in this building. I got a funny feeling we're not in a building, Bullwinkle. Well, I'll just open the door and see... Uh-oh! Gee, we must be 10,000 feet up! I don't mind that. It's that 10,000 feet down. And here we go! Sure enough, the elevator car began to drop through space. Faster and faster it went. What do we do, Bullwinkle? How about pushing the up button? No, we gotta think. Rocky, this is no time to take up a new hobby. And the car plummeted unchecked toward the earth below. Don't miss our next episode of The Ground Floor, or that's me all over. Last time you remember, Rocky and Bullwinkle were shot high into the air in an elevator car. That's funny. I could have swore I pushed the down button. Higher than the clouds, they soared, then suddenly began to fall faster and faster. <laughs> Meanwhile, 10,000 feet below, a huge truck roared through the countryside, piloted by the box top bad man himself, Hemlock Soames, alias Boris Badenov, and his confederate, Natasha Fatal. Boris, darling, your plan worked. Moose and Squirrel are out of the way at last. You said it, Kido. If all went well, they should be in orbit by now. But far from being in orbit, Rocky and Bullwinkle were approaching the Earth much, much too fast for comfort. Well, I guess this is it, old pal. It sure is. What? The end. Ooh. It's been swell knowing you, Bullwinkle. It has, hasn't it? Well, let's not say anything more about the terrible fix we're in. Let's talk about something else. Anything you say, Rock. Sure is cold, isn't it? Yeah, looks like an early fall. Bullwinkle! Oh, sorry, Rock. We had a good show while it lasted, though. Yeah, it was a big hit. Please! I meant we were a smash. That's even worse. We gotta change the subject. But, Rock, I'm talking about every day down to oh, Earth. Oh, never mind. I just hope they catch that Hemlock Soames fella. Well, at that moment, Fiduciary Blurt, the chairman of the World Economic Council, was on the phone trying to do just that. No, no, officer, in a big truck headed west. No, West, that's right. And what did you say was in the trunk? Not trunk, truck, and it's full of counterfeit box tops. 
Box tops? No box tops. Uh, could you spell it, please? B O X T O P S. B O S. X X B O X. Mm, one more question. Yes. How do you make a B? Eventually, though, fiduciary managed to alert the state police, and they started after Boris and Natasha. Listen, Boris. What's that sound? It's not the song of the open road, Svita. Look, quick, we're being followed. Yes, darling, but not very much. They're too late anyway. Look, another side of river is state line. Once we cross King's X, they couldn't catch us. You mean? Yes, nobody could possibly stop us now. But at that moment, a little way upstream, a huge object hurtled from the sky and plunged into the water. Yes, it was the elevator car containing our heroes. In a little while, it bobbed to the surface, and Rocky and Bullwinkle peered fearfully out of the top of it. Is it all over, Rock? I guess so. I didn't think it'd be like this. What one? Heaven, of course. How come it's so, so soggy? This isn't heaven, Bullwinkle. It isn't? No. In that case, how come it's so cool? Bullwinkle, we landed in the river. Oh. And we're drifting downstream pretty fast. Sure enough, the floating elevator carried our boys nearer and nearer to the bridge just as Boris and Natasha started across. The huge truck rumbled forward, then in the middle of the bridge, pulled to a halt. Boris, why we're stopping? Use your little red-rimmed eyes, Natasha. The drawbridge is up. Must be boat coming. Also, is police coming? Raskolnikov of all the times for boat to go by. What kind of nitwit would go boating at night? Thanks a bushel there, neighbor! Boris is moose and squirrel. Boris! Boris, speak to me, say something. I wonder if things like this happen to honest people. They certainly do, for at that moment our heroes were heading swiftly down the river and out to sea. Bullwinkle, we're heading swiftly down the river and out to sea. Okay, I heard the man. Well, now what? You'll find out next time in Fools Afloat or All the Drips at Sea. Well, it seems that Boris Badenov's getaway scheme has backfired. For when he tried to drive a truck full of counterfeit box tops over the state line, he was halted by an open drawbridge. Thanks a bushel, neighbor. Natasha, is that miserable moose and squirrel? I... Now, I... now, Boris, watch your language. Oh, purity. Boris, please. Innocence, honor, virtue. Boris, there is a lady present. I can't help it, Natasha. When I get mad, I'm liable to say anything. We better go, darling. Or would you rather stay here and entertain the guests? But we can't leave truck here. What will central control say? I don't know. But if we're arrested, I know what judge will say. What's that? Twenty years. <laughs> you forget I'm professional villain. You think I would run away, desert my post? Yes. <laughs> You're right. Let's go. And the two fugitives leaped over the side of the bridge just as the police arrived on the scene. That's the truck, Captain. Yeah, but those crooks got clean away. No, not quite clean, for on a girder under the bridge, dirty and disheveled, huddled Boris and Natasha. Meanwhile, our heroes, still afloat in a runaway elevator car, were drifting nearer and nearer the open sea. This looks like real trouble, Bullwinkle. Good, I hate that make-believe kind. Yeah, but we're drifting out to sea. Who knows where we'll wind up? That is bad. Sure. Because we didn't send a change of address card to the post office. But though our heroes didn't know it, they were under observation at that very moment from a Coast Guard station at the mouth of the river. What do you make of it, Carruthers? I, I don't know, Commodore. I've never seen a craft like that before. Let me see. Uh-oh. Carruthers, you fool! That's a submarine. Submarine? Certainly. Look at that silhouette. It's just like this one, see? That's a conning tower. But what's that on the top, sir? That thing that looks like antlers. Antlers? Carruthers, you've been on the beach too long. That's their radar antenna. But, but sir... Gunnery division, target bearing 250. Prepare to fire. Bearing 250. 250. And the muscles of an enormous shore battery swung ponderously toward our heroes and their makeshift vessel. Bullwinkle, they're on the shore. It's an American flag. I'm already standing at attention, bro. No, no, that must be a Coast Guard station. Hey, ahoy! It is us, Rocky Squirrel and Bullwinkle Moose. Fire! Hey, it's us, Rocky and Bullwinkle. I wonder why they're shooting at us. Must be from a rival network. Well, they missed us twice. Yeah. Well, third time's the charm. And Bullwinkle was all too right, for the next shell was right on target. Bullwinkle, we're sinking. You have certainly confirmed my suspicions, Rock. Hey, help! Looks like he's sinking, Commodore. Nonsense, Carruthers. He's merely submerging. 
Get a sub-chaser out there and depth bomb him right away. And a moment later, a fast vessel shot through the water toward our heroes. They must have seen us, Rock. They're sending out a boat to pick us up. It's going awful fast for a pickup boat, Bullwinkle. Yes, the sub-chaser roared right past our friends, and as it did, fired two huge depth charges from its stern. I wonder what those cans are. Well, this is a heck of a time to be putting out the garbage. The two charges sank beneath the river, and then as our heroes floated over them, went off with a roar. Well, is this the soggy finish of the whole ugly mess? Be sure to be with us next time for Water on the Brain or the Deep Six and Seven Eights. Well, our heroes have certainly had some terrible shocks in more ways than one. For just as they were about to be rescued by a Coast Guard ship, the vessel tossed a couple of depth charges at them. Rocky and Bullwinkle had disappeared. At the Coast Guard, jubilation reigned. Good show, Carruthers. They're gone. Thank you, sir. Send this message to Washington. Sighted sub sank same. But, sir, somebody already said that. Nonsense. If they liked it once, they'll love it twice. Yes, sir. But just then, there was a splintering crash as something flew in through the window. Something with antlers. On top of something with an aviator's helmet. It's a moose and a squirrel, Admiral. They must have been blown here by the depth charge. Then their enemy agents seized them. And our heroes were quickly subdued. I was pretty subdued when we started. All right, you. What was the name of your submarine? Submarine? Hokey Smoke. Got that, Carruthers? We sank the Hokey Smoke. What language is that? It's American, Commodore, and we're not from any submarine. No, we were blown out of a 100% all-American elevator car. An elevator car on the river? It's a long story, Commodore. And pretty involved, too. But I saw your conning tower with a radar mast. Commodore... Look, the antlers. You sank a moose. Oh, fudge. Pshaw, drat, and other salty expressions. Pretty strong talk there, Commodore. But I've already sent a telegram. Sighted sub sank same. What am I going to do? About ten years, I think, sir. No, wait. I got an idea. Oh. Fine. Wonderful. Send a correction to Washington. Mistake in previous telegram. Should have read... Sighted slob sank same. Well, that's more like it. So can we go now? Of course you can, little fellow. And our heroes were free to leave, which they did post-haste. Meanwhile, Boris and Natasha were still huddled under a bridge while above them the state police emptied their truck of counterfeit box tops. You sort of just about bust a box top racket, eh, Chief? Not so long as they still have their printing press. They can turn out another batch as big as this in no time. Natasha, you hear? We could run off another four million bogus backstops. But they will be on the lookout for us, darling. We won't be able to use them. Who wants to use them? If we still got backstops, we don't have to explain losing them don't to... Don't say it, Boris. I got to. To central control. But if we try to print more, they will put us in jail. <laughs> Natasha, which you are more scared of, United States government or central control? Let's go to press, darling. And the two frightened villains made their way off the bridge and into the middle of town, where in the basement of a shabby brownstone house, they set to work to turn out four million bogus box stops. But at that very moment, not too far away, Rocky and Bullwinkle were deep in thought. Bullwinkle, how are you going to find those box top bandits in a big city like this? Hmm, box tops. Uh... How about disguising ourselves as two boxes of breakfast food? Bullwinkle! Regular and family size! No! We call ourselves Reg and Fam and then no. we... No! It has to be something terribly clever and smart! Well, that leaves me out. But Bullwinkle, I don't have a single idea! And meanwhile, Boris is piling his bogus box tops higher and higher. Will our heroes be able to stop him again? Be on hand next time for Bullwinkle Goes to Press or All the Moose That Spit to Print. Well, it seems you can't keep a bad man down, for after all his troubles, Boris Badenov is back in business again, turning out four million counterfeit box tops. Oh, boy. One more and we're through. Then we spread them around and wreck whole American economic system. Meanwhile, just a short distance away, Rocky and Bullwinkle were trying to think of a way to find the box top bandit, unaware that they were so close to discovering his secret printing press. What we need is a brilliant idea. Something tricky, clever, and subtle. Hmm... How about putting an ad in the paper? Nah, we just... Hey, that's it, Bullwinkle. I knew I'd think of it. Well, you sure did. Yeah. Uh, what was it again? We'll advertise. Have some cards printed up. You mean like that, uh, that hitchhiker fella? 
Have fun, we'll travel. Sure, and we'll offer a reward for information about the box top bad man. How much money do you have, Bullwinkle? Well, you are in luck, Rocky. I just happen to be loaded. And our two heroes pooled their entire fiscal resources, a grand total of 27 cents, and a hand-carved skate key. Well, it's not much, but it's all we have. And that skate key is a real antique. Yeah, and... And they don't make them anymore, you know. Yeah, but... Nobody locks their skates these days. Yeah, but now we gotta get somebody to print us up some reward posters. Hey, Rocky, we're in luck. Looky here in this basement. Looks like a print shop. I'll knock on the door. You sure everything will be all right this time, darling? Of course. Moose and Squirrel found last hiding place strictly by accident. Accident? Sure, Mike. Couldn't happen again in a million years. Especially since we blew them up with change of... Howdy, Mr. Printer. Hello, Miss Print. I'd like to... It's, it's the moose. moose. Oh, Natasha, what have I done to deserve this? Well, you... Don't tell me. Just send me one of those sticks dynamite. And a moment later, Bullwinkle rejoined Rocky, who sat on the curb designing a reward poster. What did he say, Bullwinkle? He's a little busy right now, but he got me a cigar anyway. What kind? Let's see. It's a dinamite. Ah, uh, there is no such cigar. Oh. Besides, you don't smoke. Hey, that's right. I better give it back to him. Hey, here's your cigar back. I forgot I don't smoke. Hmm, nobody answered. I'll just leave it for him. And Bullwinkle slipped the sizzling dynamite through the mail slot in Boris's door. There! That ought to take care of everything. And it did. The entire building blew up, completely destroying the headquarters of the box top ring and showering the city with millions and millions of box tops. Eddie, look, it's raining box tops. Box tops? Oh, boy, we're rich, rich. Yay! Yay! And it was true. Every kid in town was soon the proud possessor of more box top premiums than he ever knew existed. And Rocky and Bullwinkle were given medals and acclaimed heroes by everybody in town. Yay! Almost. Boo! Don't be sour, Ball Boris. Look at those happy, smiling faces. I am looking. That's what makes me sour, Ball. Well, we're heroes again, Bullwinkle. Yeah, and it sure makes the fella uncomfortable. Just because they pinned a medal on your coat? Rocky, this isn't a coat. They pinned the medal on my own personal chest. And our heroes rode painfully into the sunset and toward their next hair-raising adventure. Be sure to be with us next time for further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Thank you.